Crypto has for years been the subject of fiery debate. While some view it as speculative and dangerous, others argue it's become too important to ignore. Our guests to discuss this are Michiel van Furst, he's portfolio manager of Rubico's no, fintech strategy, as well as of the next digital billion and the new world financial strategies. Busy man, welcome Michiel. Thank you. <laughs> and it's a real treat also to welcome Professor David Yermak from NYU Stern School of Business and thank you for joining us. Thank you so, very much. It's good to be here. <laughs> uh, David, before we get to you, Michiel, it's fascinating if we look at the uptake and the interest in crypto that it's, it just seems to be that it's still very much in the realm of the retail investor with limited uptake by institutional investors. So um, how do you see it as a fintech investor? Why should we be looking at it? Well, actually, so we as fintech investors, we've been observing what is going on in crypto markets for five, six, seven years. But over the past two, three years, we've seen some important developments that lead us to think that yeah, the crypto economy is, uh, is, uh, yeah, is maturing, is m moving into the mainstream, and we believe the crypto economy can grow much bigger. So that's why, as crypto investors, we are very, or as fintech investors. <laughs> Not as crypto investors. <laughs> as fintech investors, we are very interested to be exposed to that dynamic. Right, well. Lots to explore there. So David, it's good to have your perspective here. I understand your course on crypto and blockchain is the longest running university level course on the subject. How did you manage this? Yeah, we began to teach this in 2014. So it's now in its eighth year. Um, it was not taken very seriously at the time by our colleagues and we were worried about attracting students that the course might never even get off the ground. But we now have hundreds of students. We offer this um, multiple times a year. And we have a whole program now in fintech of courses that are closely related. There are many jobs that our students are interested in getting that are in the crypto economy right now. So it's really important for, for all universities to be offering this. So perhaps a leading or coinciding indicator with the, the crypto scene. Well, David, here we are with an audience of institutional investors looking at the medium term outlook for financial market returns. Why are crypto assets a relevant topic here for us? I think a very simple way to look at it is you have an asset class that's now worth two and a quarter trillion dollars, and that's big enough for everyone to take notice of it. And crypto has always had an unusual lack of correlation with the overall market and even with assets like gold. So there's a pretty straightforward portfolio argument that you would make your portfolio more efficient simply by owning a little bit of crypto for very standard risk and return and diversification reasons. But I would also say the last 12 to 18 months have been something of a tipping point that you've begun to see well-known names in finance, firms like BlackRock, um, JP Morgan, the um, Renaissance Technologies, hedge funds and so forth have all gone into crypto. In some places they are reversing long held positions and beginning to take the assets very seriously. And you've seen firms like Coinbase list in the public markets and achieve very high valuations. So I think it's become basically so big that nobody can afford to ignore it any longer. And I fully agree that it's likely to grow much, much bigger. But having said all of that, so you're observing that it's grown so much, and yet it's still such, a, such a, an emotional story. Um, it, the debate is so polarized between the, those who, who've been converted and those who are still outside of that. And yet also interesting, you see gradually more and more high profile people being converted, if you will. Yeah, JP Morgan is particularly interesting because the leadership of the bank was very contemptuous of crypto a few years ago, but now they're looking for ways to help their clients invest in it. But I think a lot of the opposition comes essentially from people who don't understand the technology because it is so radically different from what has existed before in the financial world. And there's also a lot of people who are threatened by this. There are lots of banks and asset managers, clearing houses, auditors, and so forth, who can look 10 years down the road and wonder if their firms will even exist and if they'll be able to recognize the shape of the industry once this technology begins to spread much more rapidly. And I think what you're seeing now is that a lot of them are running to regulators for protection. And you often see this in industries where the technology is changing quickly. The old firms hope that politicians can help them preserve their franchises maybe by a few more years, but the, um, the crypto assets are going to change the nature of financial intermediation very profoundly. And a lot of people very justifiably are afraid of this. 
And then perhaps one of the most controversial questions in this topic, David, is this a distinctive asset class? I think it is. You know, again, I would say the lack of correlation with other assets suggests that it's a world unto itself. And you have this whole type of decentralized finance that is beginning to raise profound questions about regulation, but also offer you know, very high rates of return to the early adopters that have been absolutely spectacular. Um, another area is the initial coin offerings that were so badly beaten down by the regulators three or four years ago. But if you bought and hold things like Filecoin or Chainlink or Augur, you've seen a whole industry grow up of decentralized smart contracts where the rates of returns to the investors have been absolutely spectacular. And I think the regulators have ignored their role in promoting capital formation. But despite that, there's been you know, huge fortunes built by early adopters and innovators in the crypto space. And there's a very good argument that there's, there's much more to come. So you say much more to come, and, and you, talk, you talk about the fact that it's, it's going to disrupt and probably is disrupting, but you couldn't, you couldn't truly say that we've already seen that, that major disruption, right? It isn't yet mainstream. We're still having this conversation. You can point to areas such as the interbank settlement market, where there's now the JPM coin being used in place of a much older system. Um, you can look at international remittances, where Ripple has begun to make incursions against the SWIFT network, but also caused the SWIFT network to modernize its own systems. Um, you can look at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, which is trading Bitcoin futures now. I think we're going into almost the fourth year of this. And the incursions month by month into the regular financial system, if you had put your, you know, averted your gaze for six months, you'd be astonished at how quickly things are changing for a technology that's barely 12 years old. Um, so I would disagree that it's not in the mainstream. I think it's moving much more quickly into the mainstream than most people realize. And you look at the valuation of Coinbase, which is on par with the very biggest banks, the Morgan Stanleys and you know, other firms. And you realize that you know, there is the arrival of a very new technology that especially appeals to the next generation. And if you sit this one out and don't take it seriously, um, there's a great risk of being left behind for something very, very important. So talking about being left behind, Rubico's five-year expected returns report suggests that asset um, allocators, so those running a multi-asset portfolio, could devote around 0 to 2% of their capital to crypto, subject to various constraints and assumptions. But are institutional investors ready for crypto? And if so, what would be their possible points of entry? You know, there's many ways you can invest in it. You can buy listed companies directly. There's not only Coinbase, but some of the mining companies. And even firms like IBM and Microsoft and JPM that have been around for a long time, if you want to participate in the crypto markets, you could just buy those stocks. But there are also now crypto ETFs in Canada and certain European countries and maybe soon in the US. And there have been essentially venture capital funds. It's not strictly VC, but there are firms like Pantera Capital that raise private partnerships among sophisticated investors who like to invest in the technology industry. And they've done exceedingly well, and these are open to institutional investors for sure. So there are many channels of, invested, of investment that are possible. You can buy the futures in Chicago if you want a heavily regulated product. Um, you can buy the crypto directly if you want to minimize costs and um, perhaps get a higher rate of return. But there's you know, a multiple number of points of entry, and increasingly these things are regulated and widely available, not only to institutions, but to retail investors as well. Well, let's bring Michiel back into the converse, conversation. Michiel, I'm watching you, you're listening intently to David, so I'm intrigued to hear if you agree. But so, as we said, you're a fintech investor, so what's your exposure then? Yeah, so that, that is a very uh, important point to make. We do not directly invest in cryptocurrencies in our fintech fund because we're equity investors, right? But it's our firm belief that the ecosystem will grow further and uh, therefore we want to be exposed to companies that service the industry and help it grow. Um, so we allocate at the moment three to five percent of our portfolio to companies that help uh, the ecosystem grow and I think over time that will grow because more and more companies are coming to the market and then we can invest in it.
Right. And also related to that mainstreaming theme. It just is part of the environment, so well, the universe increases. Well, here I completely agree with uh, David that, uh, yeah, it actually is already in the mainstream. If you see the, uh, the, the number of large companies, traditional companies that are already exposed to it, then, uh, then, then I would argue, yeah, it's already here. It's not going to go away. It will grow. Um, so learn and, and invest. Mm. Michiel, there's a great deal of criticism of crypto and Bitcoin in particular around the environmental impact, so the, the E in the ESG. So you work for an asset manager that views itself as a leader in the field of SI. So what's your position on this? Okay, so yeah, it's undeniable that the CO2 footprint of, uh, of Bitcoin is high. But a couple of points here. So first of all, um, this, this critique is, uh, mostly applies to uh, Bitcoin because the other cryptocurrencies are less exposed to it because their protocols are different. So that's one important point to make. Secondly, good to remember that this is not a flaw, it's by design, right? That there's a trade-off between the security and integrity of the system uh, and the blockchain uh, uh, and, uh, and that requires a level of energy. Um, so good to keep that in mind. And then thirdly, um, it, you know, the industry is very dynamic. So we've seen a couple of large changes over the last nine to 12 months. So for instance, mining activity, Bitcoin mining activity is shifting away from China that was very dominant uh, and it's going to the US, to Iceland. And that means that uh, when it moves into developed markets, uh, there's more transparency, there's more clarity on the data so we can make a more informed uh, assessment of what is actually happening. And, and then lastly, um, we see that the mining industry itself is also responding to the critique uh, on, uh, on the, uh, let's say, CO2 footprint of, uh, of Bitcoin. Uh, and uh, there is a, a clear trend towards yeah, more renewable sources of energy to generate the electricity to mine. So uh, all in all, this is an issue that we need to take seriously, but there are a lot of developments that to me suggest that we're moving in the right direction. David, is this in line with your views? Yeah, in fact, I, I would make a stronger statement. I don't think the industry is responding to public criticism so much as to plain incentives. That if you're mining crypto, you need to minimize your costs. You need to find energy sources with marginal cost of zero if you can. And that's renewable energy. So you see a lot of use of hydropower, of geothermal power in places like Iceland, wind power in the deserts around Texas. Um, the fraction of energy that is renewable is going up very rapidly. And I think this is a plain response to the incentives of the miners. I also think one of the most intriguing lines in your new report is to point out that the amount of energy used for gold mining every year is roughly equivalent to the amount for Bitcoin mining. And nobody has these apocalyptic you know, statements that if we allow gold to be mined, the world will overheat and we'll all you know, experience climate change that much faster. Right. I'm not sure why people bring this critique out for Bitcoin. Um, there are plenty of industries that use a lot of energy, but energy can be regulated, it can be taxed, it can be rationed. People have done this with crypto. And I'm not sure the case for regulating crypto's consumption of energy is really any different than for gold mining or any other industry that's out there. Michiel, then what about the other aspects of sustainability, well, the, the, the S and the G? Yeah, so, you know, uh, oftentimes people refer to uh, criminal activity and the use of, uh, of Bitcoin. Um, yeah, the last numbers that I have seen suggest that actually this problem is getting, uh, is decreasing, uh, if you will. Uh, because there's uh, this thing with uh, the blockchain that everything is transparent and we can track very much who is involved. Um, so uh, that is one element, a negative element on the, on the social aspect, right? But I would like to highlight a positive. Uh, and maybe I sound like a cheerleader and that's not my intention, but you know, um, in, in the core, in my view, cryptocurrencies offer the promise of financial inclusion, right? making financial services available to more people at a lower cost. Uh, and I think that ultimately that be could become a, a, a positive. Clearly that needs to be proven, uh, but uh, it's good to keep in the back of your mind when you're discussing these kind of elements as well. Uh Michiel, you and David both uh, spoke or implied that there's great disruption, it's already here and more is coming. So 
What are the implications of this disruption for the incumbent financial services companies? Yeah. Um, so as fintech investors, of course, we have already seen that a number of companies can make deep inroads into uh, the revenue pools of traditional financials. And cryptocurrencies actually could, could uh, take that even uh, uh, you know, much further. So um, David already alluded to the fact that uh, we're, we're seeing uh, yeah, decentralized uh, uh, finance uh, solutions. So what we're doing is at the moment we're building or we're starting to build applications on top of the uh, cryptocurrency uh, protocol. Um, so we're, that means that we're building financial services without a central counterparty. Uh, that means yeah, bank, uh, lending without a bank, trading without a central uh, uh, par counterparty. So completely uh, circumventing the current system. Exactly. And, um, and I think it's good to make a reference, uh, right? Uh, because in a way, we've seen something like this happening uh, uh, in, with uh, the adoption of the internet. So at the moment, it's, yeah, we estimate that roughly 200 million people are using cryptocurrencies in one shape or form. I believe we have a chart for this yes, to yeah. illustrate your point. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, and if we look back at the adoption rate of the internet, we see that the, the crypto adoption rate is following in the tracks of internet adoption. Now remember, the internet disrupted whole industries, retail, travel, uh, and what have you, right? So famous last words, but uh, if this continues, uh, we believe that, uh, that uh, crypto currencies and the applications we are building at the moment uh, could be a very disruptive force. So we're at the stage where we're sowing the seeds, if you will, but I think this is very important to continue to track and there are so many new adoptions possible and we want to yeah, stay close to that and invest whenever the opportunities uh, become available to right. us. I've got an audience question, David, I'm going to ask it of you because you spoke about uh, those who are threatened running to the regulator and the question is when do we expect proper regulation to be in place for the crypto industry? But how do you see it? Is the regulator an enabler or, or just a factor that's undermining the, the industry? It's a huge problem for the regulator because a lot of this crypto is basically a decentralized network run by computer code. There's no leadership, there's no company or entity that you can hold accountable. Most financial regulation is basically done through the intermediary. There's a bank or a stock exchange or an insurance company that has to collect information about its customers and monitor them and so forth. But when there is no central node like that, you have to regulate at the customer level one, level, one person at a time. And this becomes enormously more difficult for the regulator for things like collecting taxes, uh, policing money laundering, um, preventing capital flight and so forth. You're already seeing a huge amount of frustration in countries like China and the US where the regulators are really beginning to realize what a challenge this is going to be. I think the technology in fact is designed to avoid regulation and it's, um, it's a rude awakening for the government, which is going to have to reimagine how and even if it can regulate a lot of these platforms going forward. Final word from you, Michiel, in, in a, let's say, 10, 20 seconds, regarding your picks and shovels approach to the sector, is, is the downside of this, this not that you're not getting like, the full benefit of this amazing growth? Yeah, so, but... Uh, I, I believe, like uh, David, that we're looking uh, with cryptocurrencies, uh, it is a different asset class, right? The risk return uh, metrics are different compared to equities. I am an equity investor, so I, I, I think you can do both. So you, you, uh, you, you invest maybe in the cryptocurrencies and you invest in the companies that facilitate the growth of uh, the ecosystem. And as a final remark, just you know, imagine uh, the, you know, the, the companies that were created uh, on top of the internet. I think we will see 10 years from now, companies that are crypto native that will be as large. Uh, that is my long-term view. Michiel, thank you. David, thank you for joining us. Super getting your insights. Right.